Shalom. We have come back to the Gospel according to John. We are looking at the Hebraic background. I'm basically just going to read through the text, stopping in a few places, just to give some cultural notes. Chapter 5, 24 through 29. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that has sent me, hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. In the previous episode, we saw that Yeshua himself raised the dead. And as you know, there was contention about the resurrection of the dead, even at his time where the Pharisees and Sadducees came to argue with him about it. That contention exists today uh, in the Amidah, the section of the Amidah called the Gevurot, where it clearly states, Mechaye metim ata, you revive the dead. I grew up in a conservative synagogue, and I had always heard this portion of the liturgy said this way. But when I came to my, to my oldest nephew's bar mitzvah, my brother was in a reform synagogue, and suddenly I saw that they say the Gevuro this way, Michaye hakol ata, who give life to all, really takes a strength out of the idea of the resurrection of the dead. So the controversy continues even till this day. There is not much in Tanakh that specifically tells about the resurrection of the dead. We have the piece uh, in 2 Samuel 12.23, when David's child has died. And he says, but now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So this idea of an afterlife is present in this verse. In Hosea 13.14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death. I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Again, uh, an afterlife, the end of the concept of death. Daniel 12, 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Pretty specific, but also keep in mind that even till this day, Daniel is classified not with the prophets in the Tanakh, he's classified in the writings because he was just some kind of mystic. He was so far out that they would not consider him as a genuine prophet. In Isaiah 25, 8, he shall swallow up death in victory, and the Lord Yahweh will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For Yahweh hath spoken it in Job nineteen twenty five through twenty seven, for I know that my redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. An idea of resurrection. In Isaiah twenty six nineteen, Thy dead men shall live, together with my dead body shall they rise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. And one more Tanakh picture would be, of course, the vision of the valley of dry bones coming to life of Ezekiel. Continuing in the text, verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. 
there is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man. But these things I say, that ye might be saved. He, that is John, was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. So again we know that we need more than one witness. Continuing in verse 36. But I have a greater witness than that of John, for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself, which hath sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. A very strong indictment. He tells them that they don't have his word abiding. They don't have the Father's word abiding in them. And he also accuses them of trying to just find salvation by the law. We know that we love God and we have salvation by faith, but because we love him, we do do his works. Continuing in verse 41, I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? In other places it talks about how the people marveled because he spoke as one with authority. And so this is a common phrase to say something in the name of somebody else. And these are just a few examples. If you opened up the Talmud, you can find three or four or five on every page. So, for example, from tract Tractate to Anith, Rabbi Chizda answered, In the name of Rabbi Jeremiah ben Abba, they're giving their educational pedigree, the stream of the thought to, to prove their authority. Rabbi Samuel ben Nachamani said in the name of Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi, in the name of Rabbi Kabana, in the name of Rab. Rabbi Yochanan answered in the name of Rabbi Simon ben Yochai. Rabbi Shmuel ben Nachami, in the name of Rabbi Yonatan. Says Rabbi Yehud, in the name of Rabbi Samuel. So this was the formula for bringing a teaching. I heard it from that guy, he heard it from that guy, and he heard it from the guy before that. And Yeshua spoke without that. He just says, I just have to say what the Father has to say. So this is quite in contrast to what they're used to hearing. Finally, verse 45, Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? So just a note a bit on the Messianic expectations. We have already talked about this previously when the Pharisees came from Jerusalem and they wanted to talk to John and find out who he was and what were their Messianic expectations. So again, they, there, is a, there is an expectation of Messiah coming which is based on Tanakh, primarily Deuteronomy 18. 15 and 18, Yahweh thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. This is Moses speaking. That's why he says, if you had believed Moses, you would believe me. Moses brought this prophecy. Unto him ye shall hearken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, like unto Moses, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Some other hints we have from Genesis 49.10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall be the gathering of the people. He has to be of the line of Judah. A prophecy by Balaam, Numbers 24.17. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. 
There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Shet. Also Psalm 110, verse 4, Yahweh hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Based on other scriptures and other lines of teaching, there was already a concept of two messiahs. Messiah ben Yosef, the son of Joseph, the suffering servant Messiah, and also Messiah ben David, the conquering king Messiah. Concerning the argument of Isaiah 53, uh, there's some note in times past that this did apply to Messiah, uh, Messiah who was to come. They even tried to apply it to King Zedekiah. But by the time of Rashi, in about 1100, it was already determined that Christians were using this as an argument that Yeshua is the Messiah. And so the interpretation began to be that the passage applies to the Jewish people as a whole, and that they are bearing their own burden, which there's a lot of linguistic problem with that, but that is the current interpretation. Perhaps at the time of Yeshua, they might have accepted that this was part of the prophecy of who he was. Concerning Isaiah 7.14, this is not generally accepted and has never really been accepted. We see that the word virgin in Hebrew is Alma, which is not consistently translated virgin. It's just a young woman, in spite of the fact that in the Greek it is translated as Parthenos, which clearly means asexual reproduction. There is no se sexual act. And it does occur among some plants and bees and some small animals, some fish. However, it is not accepted by Jews because the word is alma. There is a word which means virgin specifically, and we see it in Genesis 24:16. In the Hebrew, it is bitula, and it very specifically says that she had not ever been with a man. By 1263, Nachmanides, in one of the arguments that he was forced to carry on debates between their Catholics, as it was at the time, and Jews to each defend their own faith, he specifically stated the virgin birth is wholly foreign to Jewish tradition and logic, and he being a doctor, I guess the logic figures into that for him. The basic current expectations for Messiah is that he will bring peace to the earth, and the people in his day did not see that. They, they expected him to rise up against Rome and set his kingdom into place. Clearly that did not happen. Of course, to rebuild the temple, the temple was standing at his time. To gather the Jews back to Israel, they were looking for the return of the ten tribes at that time, and to spread Torah teaching, which he did. He came to give a course correction to say, uh, he said to the Pharisees, you break the Torah to uphold the traditions of men. And so he came and he did bring Torah teaching, and when he returns, all of these things will come into place. If you are interested more in the Jewish background, I suggest that you can look at aish.com and just Google virgin birth and you will get all their opinions about it. Concerning the predictions for the coming of Messiah in, in Talmudic times, even as early as Yeshua's time, you can go to safaria.org. You can look up this tractate of Talmud, Sanhedrin 97 and 98, is largely about the arrival of Messiah. And as we continue to wait for his return, keep your eye on the sky, your redemption draweth nigh. Shalom.